Well, so welcome to part three of Insights into Israel. Uh, we have gradually been progressing around the Galilee region. And for this third evening, we will do the same before departing next week for the Dead Sea and uh, Jerusalem. So there's some interesting places still to visit. You've heard me say, unless you are a visitor tonight, uh, um, a, a quote from Stephen Notley he says, the hope is that a better understanding of the physical setting and events that frame the life of Jesus can assist us to hear more clearly the message he proclaimed. And it's not only true of the message Jesus proclaimed, it's true of all of scripture, that when you make the connections with the physical setting, so much of it comes alive. And, and that is uh, very important. This is a map from Stephen Notley's book in the Master Steps, The Gospels in the Land. And it's very clear graphics, which helps me picture where the different events that Jesus was involved in actually happened. And there we see from Nazareth, where he grew up, moving to Cana, well known for turning water into wine. Not a popular story with Baptists and Methodists and other teetotalers, but certainly Anglicans quite like that one. During lockdown, there were a number of Anglicans praying for water to be turned into wine. And I'm not sure if any verified miracles of that happening. But uh, Jesus' journey from Nazareth to Cana up to Capernaum. And uh, that was where he based himself and ministered from. And so he and his disciples would move up from Capernaum into the surrounding regions uh, in the area of Her Herod Antipas, his territory, sometimes into Tyre and Sidon. Uh, to the region of Caesarea Philippi, where you ask the question, who do you say I am? Down into Bethsaida and the Decapolis and Gergesa, which is possibly and probably where the demon-possessed man was, uh, well, with legions of demons, was set free. We have events such as the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. And central to Galilee is lake of Galilee or Lake Gennesaret and if Jesus isn't going up and around the land and region of Galilee he's crossing the lake of Galilee or the lake of Gennesaret from one side to the next and sometimes the miracles are happening in the middle of the sea walking on water uh, being in a boat that is about to be swamped then calming the storm or it's happening when he's teaching from a boat, looking out at the crowds. It's really the sense of a, a lot of Jesus' ministry and the action that takes place. You can see just from uh, Stephen's notes that you had the Sermon on the Mount, you had the home of Mary Magdalene in Magdala, you have Tiberius, capital of Antipas the Fox, Bethsaida was the city of Andrea and Peter, where possibly the multiplication of loaves and fishes happened, although. The church tradition has it as in Tabcha, uh, Chorazim and Bethsaida. They feature in Jesus' teaching on woe to you, Bethsaida, and woe to you, Chorazim. Jesus performs many miracles in his own city, which is Capernaum, at the drowning of the swine. A lot took place in that area and in that region. If you weren't uh, with me on the first tour to Israel, uh, virtual tour that is, uh, session one, we looked at uh, Mount Carmel. And I mentioned how amazing it is just to get a sense of orientation of where things in Israel uh, are, are placed. And Mount Carmel is this raised hill or, or mountain, it's an Israeli mountain. And from the top, uh, on top of the, the, the roof of a church, a flat roof, there are these signs to the different places of towns and other mountains like Mount Tabor. So you can look there and look there and orientate and get a sense of geography because often if you've stepped straight off a flight and it's one of the first places you visit, you're not sure where the coast is and why it's on that side when your body is telling you you should be fast asleep or you, you think you're going up north and you're driving south or south and you're going up north. But uh, incredible in terms of geography just to locate uh, the, the bigger sense of of Israel 
and I've opened the previous two sessions remarking on Israel being the size of Kruger National Park. That's a South African scale that helps us get a mindset right for just how small Israel is. On top of Mount Carmel, you can stand on a, on a clear day and see from one side to the next side of Israel, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. But going on a tour is not just about the geography or the scenic views. And, and the real danger of me doing insights into Israel is that it can become quite easily a, a nice snapshot and way of uh, boasting that, oh, look what I saw. And when I was there, I did this. And I really don't want that to be the case because what strikes a lot of people when they have been to Israel themselves is that what comes alive in their minds and their hearts in a way that perhaps it hadn't before were the different encounters that there are in scripture. And Mount Carmel, as I spoke about previously, was where there was a, an, a prophet encounter, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And that story comes alive, that encounter comes alive, uh, being there in person or virtually, hopefully, from my talk two weeks ago. And if it's not prophet encounters, then it's disciples encounters. And I also looked at Jesus taking his disciples into the region of Caesarea Philippi. And here is uh, archaeological remains in Caesarea Philippi itself and uh, the alcoves of, of uh, pagan temples. And if you want to find out more about the significance of that, please look up that link. But the disciples' uh, encounters with Jesus and with one another and with their own learning experience comes alive and then they become our encounters. Capernaum, I spoke of last week, a significant town in the life of Jesus and his disciples. Uh, a number of life-changing encounters happened there, healings even, uh, miracles, signs, wonders. Uh, teachings to do with treating of children. I mentioned last week realizing that a millstone in the biblical sense looked like something that could be hung around the neck as Jesus uh, warned. Uh, you know, if you do want something to one of these little ones, it's better if you had a millstone hung around the neck. I always thought of the English rounded ones. But that's how that kind of encounter, ancient encounter for the disciples, came uh, fresh to my mind being there and seeing those pictures. And then in Capernaum, seeing the ancient ruins from different centuries, and I, I went through different layers of archaeology there. I did mention, however, how I felt it had been spoilt by this UFO-style church that had been built. And that's something that I struggle with, and perhaps some of you have struggled with when you've been there in person and even in, a, in this virtual encounter and virtual tour of Israel, how there are these places of tremendous uh, historic significance and tremendous faith significance. And an attempt to capture that, uh, churches have often built church buildings over those spots. And in some instances, if not many instances, I almost feel they've, they've spoiled what was there a bit like the transfiguration of Jesus and the disciples' natural response was, oh, let's build something so that we can capture this moment and, and, and freeze it and hold on to it. So my apologies for the harsh criticism of the UFO, UFO church there, but that didn't help me in my personal encounter with that place. Interestingly enough, going to Chorazin, a place I haven't mentioned yet uh, in previous sessions, is as mentioned in, in the in the Gospels, uh, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazim are, are places that the disciples went and Jesus speaks of. You can go there and find early, earlier remains um, of, a, of a Jewish town and, and a synagogue. I don't know if you remember from last week, we looked at the limestone walls of the Capernaum synagogue and underneath were these black basalt uh, remains. Well, here in Chorazim, you see extensive use of the black basalt so from an earlier time and an even more impressively preserved synagogue. And there's me posing sitting on a seat of Moses, 
um, trying to look as learned as can be. But again, when you walk around Chorazim and you, you read the Gospels and you see it mentioned by Jesus, it just helps with that imagination to think perhaps of what was going on and how it would have looked and the, the scale of the events there. Another place to note is Bethsaida. Bethsaida. And uh, this man here that I'm pointing out with a mouse is Stephen Notley himself on an archaeological dig, because in 2017, they uncovered uh, ruins of what they believe is the lost church of the apostles. And perhaps uh, in this area is St. Peter's real house. Now, that should trigger uh, a commentary I made about Capernaum and St. Peter's house built Above that is that UFO church with a Byzantine church and then an earlier church and then the remains of a, of a domestic house going back and alleged to be St. Peter's house. Well, St. Peter's mother-in-law lived in Capernaum and so perhaps Peter did as well, but he was said to be from Bethsaida. So maybe this is the site of where Peter's real house. If there's one thing about the land of Israel, it has been contested from of old and it's still contested and even places such as where is the real Bethsaida is contested and there is a, an earlier site and, and a, a site that is alleged to be the Bethsaida but it doesn't match the geographical description in, in scripture if you really are careful in trying to compare that with what is uh, there on the ground and Stephen Notley and her team have been digging in another place and excavating another place which they are arguing archaeologically archaeologically is the real Bethsaida and the evidence fits far better than with the other alleged site so you have archaeologists argue for where the real deal place is and I, I'm happy to go with Stephen Notley because I, I think his argument is more convincing but that's all happening in as we speak. That ongoing that excavation is happening every season since 2017. And you can even go on an archaeological dig and be part of that literally groundbreaking work. And that I just say as an aside, because there's con stuff constantly being discovered in the land of Israel that proves or disproves previous theories or allegations about what was going on in the time of Jesus, if not before. And so it's actually quite an exciting space. You may say, oh, but I've, I've been to Israel. Sure, but a lot probably has happened since you were last there. And what's great is if you've never been, or you, even if you go on a trip in a few more years time, you will be on the cutting edge or something. It's not like uh, just missing out. So the Flying Saucer House, of Cap Flying Saucer Church at Capernaum doesn't do it for me in terms of encounters and helping me imagine what it's like to step back into the pages of the scripture. The church at Tabcha, well, actually I have, was strangely moved being there and seeing the intricate detail in the mosaic and the thought that's gone into the mosaic of the, the loaves and fishes and how profound it is that if you count the number of loaves, they won short, and it wasn't because the mosaic artists couldn't count to five, but there's a truth contained in that mosaic that Jesus is the bread of life. And that was a previous session. So if you want to look back on that because you missed it, you can download the link. Then also in the area of Tabcha is the Church of the Primacy of St. Peter. And this I, I copied and pasted because you can't make this up is where the altar is built upon a cliff known as Mensa Christi, the table of Christ, where the resurrected Jesus prepared bread and fishes over a fire for his disciples. This church also commemorates Jesus' reinstatement of Peter as chief apostle. Now, as I've been to Israel a number of times, the cynical side of me really struggles with these kind of places of alleged encounter, that it was at this place where Jesus had his fish brought. I always envisioned Jesus having a beach, Brian, when it came to the fish. And 
how you would know that it was at this particular spot were, were there remains of a bry from 2000 years ago i don't know and so when you are in the land of israel and whether it's an in-person tour or a virtual tour like tonight you see some of these places and for me i struggle to to have an encounter that i can then look at scripture with fresh eyes and encounter god in a fresh way so this one i place as a site alongside the ufo church doesn't do it for me however just outside that same church on the shore of galilee are steps where if you open to what god wants you can still have an encounter and numerous groups sit on the steps or on the shore and and look at jesus reinstatement of peter and the other disciples and the fish fry and it becomes again that place of encounter not in a church building but on on a on a on a lake shore on a seashore i think it's it's the the constraints of that the building that when thrown away you can actually be on the shore again and uh, re reimagine what was going on this is the church of the beatitudes and i'm afraid to say it's also in the category for me of it didn't help me in having a fresh encounter the beatitudes are jesus teaching uh, to his disciples maybe a collection of his teaching and when you go to this church and you go inside it's very kind of inward looking in this architecture and uh, there's no grand views over the, the, uh, the lake galilee in fact it's even hedged in literally hedged in by vegetation so i was wandering around trying to see a venue uh, see a venue see a view from the venue and that's in contrast to just the, the slopes and the sides of the lake galilee where i can far more imagine jesus sitting or standing with crowds gathered around him and sharing his wisdom and his his teaching on on torah and having debates and discussions and so seeing scenic shot like this becomes a place of encounter this is where i can see uh, the beatitudes taking place or jesus ongoing teaching sometimes on the slope sometimes from a boat pulled up on shore far more outdoors and speaking of boats so here we have a jesus boat on the lake of galilee it's a scaled up um, design of an actual earlier boat that was nicknamed the jesus boat that was found in the mud and you can go to the museum and see the remains of that, that that's quite profound but there are these scaled up models and they cruise around the lake and you all stand to attention at the start as your country's flag is raised up and they play your national anthem and you now feel compelled that because your flag is flying and your national anthem has been played you all have to stand with great patriotism and, and sing out your national anthem and uh, then i think the the captain of the uh, boat or the ship makes a call on the country and their type of christianity and then puts on worship music but you have it on very loud and you'll hear like a, a bad neighborhood house party going down across the lake as this one boat is playing worship music and on this is another one and they they try to stay well clear from one another but you can you can hear the competing sounds of, of the worship music and that doesn't do it for me however well oh, before i said however and then you always get a special display of uh, biblical fishing and i don't know if all the uh, guys have been given the same script but uh, in the hearing of the the, the sh ship captain or whoever's going to cast the net they, they say that uh, a very special display has been put on for you and you you feel like you're the only group that this has gone has been done for when it's probably every single group and you get an example of a net being thrown out and 
there's never a fish caught. Well, it'd be interested to know if a fish has ever been caught, but there's some comment when the net comes up empty and uh, a great uh, dramatized disappointment. And this is the however, despite what for me are distractions from singing the national anthem and having compu competing worship sounds going across the, the waters, actually it can also be a place of encounter. Jesus who encountered his disciples on the boats of old can also do it on the, the boats that are new. And given the space and the time and sometimes turning the music off with some reflection and some quietness, it becomes a place of worship and encounter. And on this, close to the lake, is a town of uh, Magdala. And my comment earlier that uh, things are always being discovered in the land of Israel, well, this is a case in point. This is a, a first century synagogue was discovered, I think, in 2009 when the, they were trying, the Roman Catholic Church was trying to develop a, a guest house or guest hotel. And as they were digging up, they came across uh, what was a, a, called the Magdala Stone. And it's uncovered a first century synagogue, which is one of only a handful found. And Stephen Notley says it's one of the finest examples of stonework ever discovered from the days of the Second Temple. And that stonework includes exquisite um, mosaics. And this is the Magdala stone that was uncovered in 2009. And you think, wow, so if you have been to Israel before 2009, this was not discovered. And the uh, excavation that took place over the next few years has created a, a wonderful space uh, around this archaeology. But in 2021, a second synagogue was uncovered in the ancient town of Magdala. And this is a first in all Israel because it's the first time that two synagogues from that uh, second temple period have been found in the same ancient town. So even if you'd been after the first synagogue had been uncovered, now in 2021 during lockdown when people had a lot of time on their hands, yet another synagogue was excavated. There's always something new coming to light. But at Magdala is a church that I think has been done beautifully. Un unlike some of the others that I apologize for, for shredding and, and putting down, there is the, uh, uh, my Latin's not great, duck in altum, dus in altum, duck in altum. Um, it's commemorating Jesus saying, put out into deeper water. And it's this, beautiful stone architecture and there's a chapel that looks out uh, onto the lake and quite cleverly if you get your level right uh, sitting in the pew and looking out it looks as if the the boat that is the the communion table is floating on the water and that's very clever uh, architecture But what moved me tremendously was the fact that this chapel is dedicated to the woman of uh, the New Testament. And they have purposely called the whole complex a chapel and not a church. And, and when asked why, the, the guy, local guide of the chapel said, if, you, if it is a church, it has to come under the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. But as it's a chapel, it is less hierarchical and they have greater freedom on how they define th that church space. And the, the vision of that space is for it to be an interdenominational space that honors all members of all churches, but in particular, the women of faith. And in the heart of this church, in, in a circular atrium, are eight pillars and in carved into the pillars are the names of um, uh, eight women, some mentioned by name um, and some, some just referred to by the by in scripture. 
and you have Mary Magdalene, and you have Mary and her sister Martha, Susanna and Joanna, Salome, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, who's not named uh, except as an aside, Mary, wife of Cleophas. And then they have one pillar to many other women, because scripture talks about many other women uh, assisting Jesus, being the disciples of Jesus. And a final pillar is an unmarked pillar. And the invitation is to name people who've been instrumental in your encounters with Jesus. And especially to name them if they are women of faith. And so it's wonderful taking a group there and just inviting reflection, personal reflection, obviously not out loud, but to say who, whose name is on that pillar. Who in your life has helped you have those encounters with Jesus? And this is taking it then beyond the land of Israel to say we, we learn from the geography and the land of Israel and then the architecture that can reinforce a, a good message or UFO kind of undermine um, that encounter. Um, but it then becomes fresh off the pages of scripture. And tonight, I just want to mention a very special uh, woman in my life, Heather Johnson. I spoke about her uh, at Christ Church Kenilworth in my sermon when I was talking about the cloud of witnesses, uh, how, how we run this race. And I mentioned a number of significant people in my life. And I mentioned Heather as one of those, someone who had modeled a, a wonderful spirituality, a, a gracious a uh, way of engaging with the world, holding the beauty of the world in tension with the, the harshness of injustice. But she passed away this morning. And so I want to honor her just in this moment to say, this is one of the women whose names is on that pillar in, in my mind. So when I was there, that was the name that I would have put on that pillar. And then when I go back to the land of Israel, I will call to mind Heather Johnson as one of those profound Christian women in my life who I'm deeply indebted to for having uh, helped me encounter Jesus. So if you want homework, I haven't often given you homework, but you could call to mind the significant people in, in your lives, especially if they're women in keeping with uh, this chapel to, to honor them in some way. But this is where then the, the land and the archaeology and the geography all connect because underneath this atrium at Magdala is another chapel and it's called the Encounter Chapel. And it's right down at the level of the first century marketplace of the Magdala port. First century, conceivably, the level at where Jesus walked over uh, when, you know, going around the lake or coming into Magdala Port if he was crossing from one side to another. Scripture doesn't mention it a tremendous amount, except that there's Mary from Magdala. And in this encounter chapel, with you standing on the first century marketplace uh, level, you look at a beautiful mural, which you see on uh, before you. It's unbelievable. Uh, of the woman who suffered from bleeding reaching out to touch the hem uh, of Jesus' uh, cloak or his prayer shawl. Uh, and it's in that space with that connection with the, the literally the first century landscape that the imagination can come alive in, in a way that really helps fresh encounters with Jesus. And an example of this was when I took a, a group there in 2019. We were hearing of different encounters that women had with Jesus, and in particular, uh, the, the encounter depicted by this mosaic. And we had a time of prayer ministry afterwards. And someone in our group, um, she had learned that morning that her daughter-in-law, I think it was, um, who was pregnant, had started bleeding and had had to see uh, her obzangani specialist as a matter of urgency 
and she just asked, please, would we pray for her? Now, having just heard that story, been standing in front of that mosaic on the level of the first century marketplace. Wow, we, we, we prayed in an earnest way. And lo and behold, and it probably shouldn't come as a surprise, but oh, me of little faith, we heard in the afternoon that the matter had resolved itself and uh, she was out of, of, of danger. And I put that down to, to prayer. An amazing Jesus encounter from of old coming again uh, right then and there. And there's just a beautiful picture of my wife in you know, a very arty reaching out. I think that's that's the invitation, whether we are, go to the land of Israel in person or virtually or in our imagination in the pages of scripture is, is to be the ones who in faith reach out to 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 touch Jesus and to, to encounter him and invite encounter. All these examples of Galilee have been of the New Testament or the gospel encounters. But I could actually do several more weeks just looking at some of the more ancient encounters. And that's the richness of the land of Israel is the depth and the layers of history. In fact, it can be frustratingly so that you're wandering around and anything that's just a mere 800 years old, that's too recent history. Thousand years old. Oh, not interested. You pass it by and, and you focus on, on the things that matter to that particular tour. In one of the regions of Tal Dan, uh, further up north in, in the northern Galilee region, are the ancient remains of an altar that dates back to the third phase of development during the reign of Jeroboam II, Jeroboam II. So at that site, third phase, because there was a second phase and a first phase of building that archaeologists have documented, that corresponds then to the ancient accounts in the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, um, of the drama of the kings and this com com competition or competing building on this high place and that high place. And here was built an altar and this was going on in Jerusalem. And it can read like, a Game of Thrones kind of drama and be very distant and removed and almost mythological until you standing in that very place and seeing remains and going, oh, this is not myth. This is for re real. Reading so far back, thousands of years back, never mind the, the New Testament, but into the ancient Hebrew scriptures, it's real. It's real history, not made up myth. And a number of people who've come on tours, that is the thing that has struck them. It's bolstered their faith in what they read in the Bible. And then flowing out of that is their faith in the God of the Bible. And so it's even the, the more ancient or most ancient encounters that can come alive off the pages of, of scripture and reinvigorate a, a person's faith and, and faith in the faithfulness of God. For me, this I found mind blowing. And if I go back and, and listen to the most recurring word in these sessions, this probably is mind blowing because everything is mind blowing, but this one really is mind blowing. It's nicknamed Abraham's Gate, and it's also found at Tel Dan. There's a lot of ancient stuff in, in that re region. It's a brick structure dating back to 1750 BCE. Let's do the maths on that for a moment. On one of our tours, we had someone who was in brick production in South Africa. He has a big... Uh, brick factory in, in the Western Cape. And he was standing in front of a brick structure that dated back to 1750 BCE. If there was ever a good marketing PR opportunity for use, use of bricks, 
it's this. And this is likened or, or in, in tradition to being the, the gate that Abraham, the biblical patriarch, passed through when he was rescuing Lot. And if you read in Genesis 14, 14, it documents the high drama and, and Abraham chasing Lot's captives to Dan, to the city of Dan. And here we have uh, a, a city gate. And could it be that Abraham went through this as, as the legend or, or the tradition holds? Well, if it wasn't this gate, we're still looking at something from an era which is old enough. And so again, the, 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 the stories have significance because it's not made up myth, but it, it's, it's actual history. To kind of conclude, I think for many people going to the Galilee region, it's actually the lake itself, the tranquility of being able to walk on the side of the lake and uh, find some quiet time. It's often a place where the tour groups will have a, a sunrise service or a sunrise communion or invite people to go and have quiet times. I uh, met someone from a, another church entirely who has never been on any of our CMJ tours or any of my tours, who uh, on his tour to Israel uh, didn't feel up for that day's activities. And that's the, there's a wonderful freedom you, if you don't want to do everything on that itinerary, as long as you're not disrupting the tour, you could stay behind in one place as long as the bus is returning to that place. And he sat on the side of Lake Galilee and in the quietness and the stillness, he said he just spent the time reflecting and weeping. And when his wife came back from the day's activity, could see obviously that he had had quite an encounter and asked, you know, how was your day? And he said, it was absolutely fine. <laughs> and yet God had done something in, in that quietness. I love this uh, picture. I'm reminded of uh, things being made new with every sunrise. Um, it says God's mercies are new every morning. And isn't that the case? I think my final thought before I close with uh, something by Heather Johnson, is that God is a God of encounters. We see that from the beginning of Scripture, where God seeks out Adam and Eve. We see that in the life of Jesus, who is all about encountering people where they're at. Even the woman by the well, uh, he had to go through Samaria to, to have that encounter with that woman by the well. The post-resurrection experiences, Jesus meets people where they're at, in their doubts, in their fears, and speaks peace and brings hope and his true shalom or, or wholeness. And being able to go to the land of Israel or even hopefully through this virtual tour to Israel, we reminded that God in Christ is still in the same business of encountering us where we're at. So he has of of old, and, and that you can see when you go and use your imagination uh, to, to remember what happened in a particular place with that geography or the archaeology helping bring it to life. But the good news is, because this is who God is, is God is willing and able and seeking to encounter you and me where we're at tonight don't have to go to Israel to meet with God in a special way. It's really just being open to God in this moment. And this is where I want to read a, a poem, which is a, like a prayer written by Heather Johnson. And she entitled it Open Hands. I want to end with this. Open hands are not closed hands. They are not fists for fighting. Do not greedily grasp, neither can they wound or conceal. Open hands do not say no. 
Lord, help me to open my hands, that they may rest unclenched, waiting to receive. Help me to open them gently, hold them vulnerable and ready for all you give or take. Lord, help me to keep them open, so not to bruise the treasures from pain or diminish the surprises of joy, nor harm the miracles of healing. Lord, help me to open my hands enough to say yes to you.